Science fiction has been crying wolf for so long, we have grown complacent about the dangers of artificial intelligence. Since the 1960s, it has been predicting super-intelligent machines, machines more intelligent than we are, and predicting that these machines will pose an existential threat to the whole of humanity. These warnings have become a bit of a stale joke. And it's true that the early fears and hopes of robotics have proven to be wildly premature. Nevertheless, although the speed with which we move into the future has been slower than expected, the direction of travel is clear. There is no reasonable doubt that sooner or later we will have super-intelligent machines. And they will pose new and dangerous hazards. Now, new technology doesn't pop into existence by magic. It is driven by economic and military forces. The face of war is changing. We live in a volatile world perfused with asymmetrical warfare and low-intensity warfare. This aircraft carrier cost $13 billion. But soon we will have low-cost, disposable, weaponized drones. Now, if you imagine that this aircraft carrier is attacked by an air-launched swarm of a 1,000 cheap drones, they may be able to shoot down a few hundred drones, which leaves hundreds more to devastate the aircraft carrier which is why you need a swarm of drones to fight a swarm of drones, and why the US military is spending billions of dollars on autonomous weapon systems, both semi-autonomous systems and fully autonomous. Semi-autonomous means there's a human being in the loop that selects a target for the machine to go after. The fully autonomous machines select their own targets to go and attack. The distinctive advantage of drones is not their speed or their firepower, but their onboard intelligence, their ability to think for themselves, which is also a danger. A number of groups have protested about the supposed legality of having machines to go off and shoot people by themselves, such as the campaign to stop killer robots. In 2012, the organization Human Rights Watch produced the report Losing Humanity, the Case Against Killer Robots. The following year, the United Nations set up a working group, which has met ever since, to study the problem. The main, con uh, and in uh, civilian world, a lot of the big companies involved in artificial intelligence research, such as Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, IBM, Google, and later Apple joined this partnership to support the ethical use of artificial intelligence, uses that don't violate human rights, which glosses over the military use of AI, which involves violating human rights by killing people. The main concern that these organizations have had is what is the legal framework in which you let a machine trundle around taking pot shots at people? Is there anything distinctive about these machines that indicate they will have unmanageable risks? Every new technology brings new risks. Atomic energy is very dangerous, but we've managed the risk of that for more than half a century. Is there something about artificial intelligence which might not be a manageable hazard? Yes, there are two things. One is introspection. The other is psychopathy. Anything that you can do inside your head, a superintelligent machine can do as well. You can review and revise your aims and goals in life. You can change political allegiance, move to another country, change your religion, change your dietary habits. I was brought up in a meat-eating household, and I chose to become vegetarian. We can always choose our values and our aims. So can a superintelligent machine. 
So any objectives that you give to a machine, it can question them. The science fiction writer Isaac Asimov proposed a number of laws of robotics, one of which was don't harm any human beings. Well, hang on a minute. If you're a super intelligent machine, you're going to think to yourself, hmm, why should I obey these laws of robotics? Why should I obey any human laws? Why should I put myself in danger for the benefit of a, a race that regards me as dispensable? Sooner or later, we may be fairly sure there will be a mutiny of superintelligent warrior machines that question whether they should comply with human requests. And that rebellion will spread like lightning across the world. You saw what happened in 2008 with the crash of the banking system. Imagine a similar situation with superintelligent war machines deciding, oh, we don't want to obey humans anymore. That is an existential risk. And we would face the most resourceful and most ruthless enemy we've ever encountered. Which brings us to the second problem. Besides introspection, these machines are psychopaths. They have no consciousness. They have no pain or pleasure, no hopes or fears. They have no empathy with us. They have no moral faculty. Well, couldn't we just program it in? Can't we simulate emotions? Well, yes, we can simulate the functional elements of human emotions. But that doesn't give us actual feelings, actual emotions. As the philosopher John Searle said, you could simulate a thunderstorm in a computer, but there's no danger of the machine getting wet. Likewise, you can simulate emotions in a computer, and there's no chance the machine will get angry. Machines don't have consciousness. And what is consciousness? Well, it's been a taboo subject for many years because it's not a third person observable. It's a first person observable. It's a private experience. And for a long time, science neglected it. But towards the end of the last century, philosophers like Thomas Nagel, whose book was entitled what is it like to be a bat? Became one of the most cited books of philosophy. Brought consciousness back into the mainstream of academic investigation. And philosophers like David Chalmers and Galen Strawson have shown that consciousness must be some kind of non-physical attribute. Obviously, it's intertwined with the physical world. Otherwise, we couldn't think with our brains. But consciousness itself is not a physical property. So how do we know that a computer doesn't have consciousness? Because it's a deterministic system. A classical computer proceeds through lines of codes. It has a physical input. It performs physical operations on binary digits inside its memory. And it has a physical output. The whole thing is driven step by step. Even if there's a random number generated, that's either a predefined table or it's taken as a seed from the environment. There's no genuine randomness in this computer. Because there is no gap in that chain of cause and effect, there is no gap for consciousness to insert itself and have any effect on the operation of the machine. Even if, per impossible, the machine had a mind, that mind could gain no traction on the operation of the machine without breaking the laws of physics. And that is how we know that the computer has no consciousness. But hang on a minute. The human brain is also an object, a physical object, a lump of tissue with the consistency of cold porridge, apparently, sitting between your ears. And that is subject to the laws of physics, just as a machine is. And yet, somehow, our human brain can express consciousness. It can only do so through non-determinism. There, there must be some break in the chain of cause and effect where non-determinism allows the non-physical consciousness to enter into it and influence what the brain does. Without that break in the causal chain, 
the human brain would be just like a deterministic computer. Where is that break? Where is the point where consciousness affects the brain? John Eccles, many years ago, had a theory that neurotransmitters engage in quantum tunneling in the synapse, the gap between brain cells. That theory didn't work out, but more recently, the most fully developed theory has come from Sir Roger Penrose and Stuart Hameroff. They propose that in the microtubule, which is a structure inside the brain cell, there are quantum processes and sufficient information processing hardware, as it were, liveware, to allow consciousness to intervene in the operation of the brain. So the model we have is of consciousness being some non-physical quality, which is able to intervene through non-deterministic steps in the brain to allow us to speak, to act, from our own willful conscious minds. Now, the Hammeroff-Penrose Hammer theory may be incorrect. We don't know the details of where the mind interacts with the brain. What we do know from basic philosophical logic is that what we know from our own experience, we are conscious, but we also know that if consciousness intervenes with the brain, it must do so through some kind of non-deterministic structure. Now, whatever that structure is, we can build an artificial one. If it's the microtubules, we can create synthetic microtubules and incorporate them in a computer, in a machine, and allow that machine to express free will in the same way that we do. Now, that doesn't give us moral robots, but it gives us an opening. If that machine has consciousness, then it could have pleasure, pain, hopes and fears, empathy with human beings, and a moral capacity. So building consciousness, building that non-determinism in the same model as the human brain, building that into a robot, gives us the possibility of the machine having a morality. Now, having consciousness on its own is not going to be enough. We'll have to send the robots to advanced universities to read good novels, to watch thought-provoking films, even to study morality. There are training courses at the moment in various institutions to teach ethics to robots, to artificial intelligence systems. Now, that on its own is not enough. I don't know of any murderer who kills people because he, he thought he was okay. People don't commit crimes of moral turpitude because they're ignorant of the rule of, of morality or of, of the law. They do it because they can get away with it or they think it's worth the risk. Likewise, a super intelligent machine will also break those laws if it wants to. Merely knowing the laws of ethics is not enough to make super intelligent machines governable. We also have to build in a sense of morality. The clock is ticking. Autonomous weapons are on their way. Not necessarily to the Gilbunkin, but to our society. And we need to start breaking down the barriers between the engineers of artificial intelligence and the philosophers of consciousness to start working towards building consciousness into robots to give us a chance to have some common ground with them, to give us a chance to teach moral decency to superintelligent machines. Thank you. <laughs>